I think we should get started because it's already 2.7 and I'm sure there will be a few more who will join during the course. So welcome everyone to the Connected Insights uh, Web Summit and, uh, and to today's panel discussion. Thank you so much for joining and we're super excited to be here. There's going to be a lot of value packed into today's session. So please make the most of it by uh, you know, engaging with the speakers. As I just mentioned, uh, you know, if you could introduce yourself in the chat box, uh, that would be great. We'd love to know more about you. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself, my name is Priya Shakori, and I am a co-founder and partner at Connected Law. We're a new age, age law firm, and we help connect clients with, uh, with, you know, with lawyers, with boutique firms and senior lawyers with the relevant expertise. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an example, uh, you know, we as a law firm, we understand client requirements. So, for example, if we get an IP matter, we make sure that the matter is delivered by a senior IP lawyer or a boutique IP firm with uh, who, you know, who can offer cost effective rates. Um, so um, let me introduce uh, today's topic to all of you. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of innovation in uh, this region and a large chunk of this region's economy is driven by SMEs and startups. Uh, now with this growth, IP considerations have become paramount and for companies to really take their business to the next level, they need to have an IP strategy. So, uh, you know, so the question today is how do we go about preparing or implementing an IP strategy? And that's the million dollar question that uh, we're gonna tackle in today's panel discussion. Uh, we're very excited to present today's uh, distinguished panel of IP specialists and lawyers who've worked on a lot of landmark IP matters. Uh, we have Vivek Singh from Sagacious IP, Munif Kanawati from Sabah IP, Helen Tung of New Space 2060, and Payal Manhas of, uh, from Landmark Group. So maybe what we could do is we could spend uh, the next couple of minutes just getting an introduction from each of the speakers. Um, Vivek, maybe we could start with you. Uh, over to you, Vivek. Hi, thank you, Vyasa. I hope I am audible. Uh, sure. Yes, you 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 you're audible, Vivek. Uh, no, I mean I think now uh, for some reason I can't hear you. Vivek is on mute. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think I should be audible. Yeah. Now you are. Okay, so thank you. First of all, Priyasha and, and everyone in this call for, for arranging this session and inviting us to talk to the audience and talk them, to them about the IP right. So I'm Vivek Singh and I am an Indian IP attorney based in New Delhi. And uh, I'm representing my firm uh, called Sagacious IP, which is based in uh, India and, and some other countries, including US and Europe. And we are working with uh, like diverse set of clients, including the Fortune 500 companies, startups, individual inventors from India and across the globe. And we are helping them in, in all the aspects of IP, starting from searching, drafting, filing, and prosecution and litigation also in India and, and uh, in all the important jurisdictions. And before, uh, uh, like uh, into going into the full fledged IP uh, practice, I was also associated with uh, FICI. So FICI is the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. It is the, uh, the biggest uh, industry body in India. And that is working primarily uh, as a connecting link between the government as well as industry and, and working towards the policy level changes. So I have noticed and I have worked uh, on that level wherein the I was involved in, in some of the matters wherein Indian government has taken a lot of initiative and policy level changes. I'll be talking in detail about all those changes which have happened in last three, four years in India. And because of these, India has a new and totally new IP regime, I will say, as compared to uh, what was uh, here uh, five years back. So I'll be talking mm -hmm. about in detail uh, on all those points. So 
this is from my side over to okay. Yesha and I'll be talking yeah. about yeah. all those points in detail. Yeah. So I think uh, Munif, maybe uh, you could go next. Sure. Thank you, Priya. And thank you for the for the introduction and thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Munif Khanawati and I'm, had the, I'm the head of the business development uh, for the GCC at Saba IP. I'm a law school graduate and I have 20 years of experience in business operations across the MENA region. Uh, so I, I primarily advise, advise clients on how to execute and how to develop their IP strategies, how to deploy them and how to uh, capitalize on those uh, strategies from time to time. Um, um, in, in, as, as SAB IP, we, we were established in 1926, so we are almost a 100-year-old uh, firm, and we're very focused uh, on IP, and this is what, what we do day in and day out. Uh, in the UAE, we've been operational in, since 1964, so before the union. Um, we advise clients from, from all domains, all sectors. Uh, we have clients from the startup um, uh, phase on up until the large organizations, multinationals, and Fortune 500, uh, Fortune 500 companies. Um, and this is what we do. We, we're into prosecution, we're, we're into enforcement, we're, we're pretty much uh, all about IP. So I hope this, this uh, session is uh, uh, informative for, for the audience. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks, Maniv. Um, Helen, maybe you could uh, go introduce yourself. I mean, thanks for joining in. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thanks, Riyasha. I'm very happy to join today, and I saw some familiar faces in, or names, so I'm really glad uh, we're all here today. Um, so what's interesting is I'm a barrister by training, and I also work with entrepreneurs, but today my hat is actually from the other side of the fence, so actually as an in-house counsel. So I think this could be quite a balance conversation that we're going to be having so um yeah so i uh, i pretty much I'm, I'm qualified as a barrister back in england so litigation has been my background primarily although i spent a considerable time working with entrepreneurs which is what i call my passion so um yeah i look forward to today's session uh, thank you thank you helen and over to you Payal. Uh, Payal, you're on mute Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks, Priyasha, and hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Payal, and I have uh, about 14 years of work experience as an in-house counsel. I work for various MNCs uh, into diverse businesses uh, like retail, manufacture, hospitality, leisure and entertainment, healthcare, digital, and e-commerce. Presently, I am the group legal counsel uh, with Landmark Group in Dubai. I look at... Um, IP protection, IP licensing and franchising, digital and e-commerce matters. Um, I thank Priyasha for having me here today in this forum. And uh, I look forward to share my personal views and experiences uh, in the interaction. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Priya. Thank you, everyone, for your introductions. I think we, uh, we're ready to get started. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with like a very basic premise. I'm going to start with, uh, you know, just back to the basics understanding, because I know that a lot of, uh, you know, the attendees today might not really have a full picture of what really is intellectual property. So I think uh, we could start, uh, and I'm going to start, uh, ask Vivek this question. Uh, what do you really mean by intellectual property? Because I think a lot, okay. of, a lot of us might not really have a very clear picture. OK, OK. So I will give a very, very uh, layman's definition of yeah. intellectual property. And what I discuss in all my webinars and, and give the example. So what I try to do, I correlate intellectual property with the property because all the business owners and entrepreneurs and, and inventors can understand what property is. So property could be like your real estate, your house, your plot, your flat, and your vehicle, your car, your motorcycle could be another type of property, your cash, your jewelry, gold, diamonds, could be another type of property and your furniture could be another type of property. And we understand like what property is. So property is anything which has some value associated with it. When we put uh, a prefix before property and put the word intellectual property, the context remains the same. It means to say intellectual property is also a property which has some value associated with it. But there are two disclaimers. And these disclaimers are the, the intellectual property
property is a sort of virtual property. You cannot touch and feel that property with your hand, number one. And number two, intellectual property is the creation of human intellect. There are two disclaimers. Otherwise, everything will remain the same in between property and intellectual property. So this is what I, I uh, try to explain when, when I talk to business owners about intellectual property. And uh, when... Yes, yes. Uh, no, no, yes. go ahead. No, I think, no, that's really interesting. Uh, you know, just to correlate it to the other kinds of properties, uh, you know, it helps because a lot of times, uh, you know, IP is a very intangible sort of, uh, uh, you know, aspect. So, so many people don't quite under, uh, grasp the importance of it. But yeah, it's, it's good when you, you know, correlate it to other kinds so of property, like real estate. Intellectual property, most of the people, they understand that this is something very, very alien. And it is not, and they understand that property and intellectual property are very, very diverse things in terms of the value, but which is not the fact. Both are having a similar or both carry the similar uh, properties and, and the similar value. But in terms of intellectual property, there are just two disclaimers. That's it. Otherwise, it's also a property. It has value associated with it. And, and if you are going to register uh, your intellectual property, like we do for property, so there are uh, benefits. I'll talk mm -hmm. about these benefits uh, uh, during the... Uh, yeah, yeah. No, no, sounds, sounds great, Vivek. Yeah, no, so that's that's really helpful, Vivek. So I guess that brings us to the you know second key aspect: why protect intellectual property? And and maybe Munif, if you could shed a little bit of light there. Sure. Well, uh, the 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 moral answer would be that it is just and appropriate to 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 create to protect the the creation of the mind, uh, the human intellect. It's it makes perfect sense to protect uh, those creations, um, even from a, from a business standpoint. You're talking. Vivek was mentioning the the uh, uh, the intangible asset aspect of it, and it's it's quite important. I, I would like to highlight this uh, as much as possible because today in today's world the um, brand valuation is probably probably consists like 80% or 90% of the value of, of a company, the brand on its own. Uh, we're talking about the large organizations, the multinationals, the, 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 the most valuable uh, brands in the world. So the infrastructure, yes, it makes perfect sense. It is valuable, the expertise, the exposure, the, the geographical footprint, yes, they do have a value, but the, the, the biggest chunk goes to your, your um, uh, IP assets. And it, it, uh, we, throughout this, this conversation, this conversation will, will, uh, will cover um, uh, all aspects, but basically in a nutshell, um, yes, it is just and appropriate from an ethical standpoint, from a moral standpoint, but also it makes perfect sense when it comes to the financial, the return on investment. Um, mm -hmm. As a business, your main goal is to grow. Your main goal is to achieve uh, year over year um, uh, growth, uh, financially speaking. Uh, how do you achieve that without proper IP uh, structure, without IP, uh, proper IP protection, without a proper IP strategy that you follow uh, to the T? So, uh, yeah, it's, it makes perfect sense to have a proper IP strategy in place. No, no, makes a lot of sense, Munif. Thanks a lot. So I think maybe what we could do is we could uh, discuss a little bit about uh, a few anecdotes about what happens when you don't protect IP. And maybe, you know, I would love to hear some examples uh, from... Uh, the panelists. Uh, um, so, I mean, I don't know, Pyle, if you want to mention, and Pyle and Helen, if you want to give a few examples of what happens when you don't protect uh, IP. And, you know, I'm sure some, you would have seen some of the examples in your real life. This should be exciting. Yeah, yeah. I think this is, <laughs> this is going to be an interesting chat. Yeah, I suppose uh, I can, I suppose I can start. So, um, there's been some cases I did when I was back in England, uh, particularly in relation to trademark. And, you know, I guess uh, some of you may understand, you know, different people, different cultures. And at that time I was dealing with a lot of Chinese clients who at the time were talking maybe 10 or so years ago, were just exploring how to do business internationally. And there were, I would say it's, it's intellectual property, probably as a concept, the problem of not understanding as a concept in, in the Western common law sense, and then also not really understanding what the implications are. 
So to give an example, I was working with one company who the CEO didn't speak a word of English, but he had a middle management of, say, 20 people who had the ambition of, you know, expanding and exploring in the whole of Europe. But they encountered, obviously, one intellectual property case, which I would have said could have destroyed the whole business plan um, for the, I guess, lack of appreciation. That's probably the better word of it. I mean, it's speaking to the converted here because everyone here is in here and interested in IP. But I guess what would be useful is maybe tapping into how much knowledge and understanding your client has probably does help a lot. Because when I realized at that point, um, you know, notwithstanding the case and them not providing me any sufficient details to support their designs, as it were. It was basically designs of beds that they exported around Europe. Um, and instead, the, the counter, the, the claim itself was basically that they've fobbed off another, you know, manufacturing company. So you can see the sort of scale and implication of that. If they were sort of, as it were, found, you know, foul of the law in that jurisdiction, how they would look in other nearby jurisdictions. But it was amusing for me because I had to go back to the basics on everything. So, obviously, in that case, it settled for better lack of reasons. I couldn't imagine having the CEO on the stand. It just would not work. <laughs> so, despite how wonderful you think your client is, sometimes you really need to ask yourself honest questions. How will they look in front of a judge? How will they actually, are they able to answer their questions, you know, coherently three mm -hmm. times over? So, there were all these kind of little things that happened. But I think now there's a great appreciation and so, um, yes, that's just one story I wanted to share. Uh, no, that, that, that's an interesting one, Helen. Uh, what about you, Payal? Uh, you know, you've you've yeah. worked on, uh, you've spent quite some time in the Middle East, and I'm sure you you, you would have seen a lot of uh, you know IP counterfeiting cases. So maybe you can share a few examples there. Yeah. So uh, when we talk about IP, it includes uh, trademarks, patents, designs copyrights, any any of literary or, uh, uh, you know, uh, which, which can be published, any idea. All of this, you know, uh, when you are part of a corporate and when you have a product or a service, all of this is actually a very important component of your product itself. And uh, if it is not there, then there is definitely something in the case when you find that you know uh, you've not been able to protect uh, your IP in any form, like a trademark or a patent or a design for that matter, uh, you would come across problems like you know. It depends. I will start that you know when your product goes to a store, a physical mm -hmm. store in the market, and you suddenly find that you know uh, you did not have a protection for their brand name, you did not have the for the ingredients or the kind of method you used for making that product, uh, you run the risk of getting copied. You run the risk mm -hmm. of people copying uh, uh, your quality product for lesser quality products. You would mm -hmm. find your brand being, uh, you know, tweaked a low grade products. So how to stop that? You know, you need to stop all this. You need to protect yourself from all of this. So if in case you have, uh, you, you know, one is you have started a new business, a new product. In case you want to expand, then again, you need your, you know, protections for your IPs, for all of your IPs, your brands, your patents, your designs. So, you know, when you go to a store, you can face counterfeiting. You uh, are into exporting business. You're exporting products to various countries. There again, you know, the importance of protecting your IP comes into picture. You need to register. You need to file applications. You need to conduct a search, a prior search, that your products are going into a particular country uh, where your whatever your brand or a product or a technology you're sending is free from any third party. Uh, uh, you know, objection or a violation. So it's a it's a two-edged sword. One is that you need to protect your own products. The other is that, you know, um, you do not have to violate any third-party uh, IP also. So tomorrow mm -hmm. my product is going to US and uh, if we do not conduct a search, we might find that, you know, we will have uh, a third party objecting to our exports. And then mm -hmm. it's 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 a it's a lot of issue. It's a lot of problem. Uh, you would not have your uh, products out of your customs. You know the customs of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, the third very important aspect now that we see is e-commerce. 
We have got yeah. uh, you know various shopping websites, uh, which are standalone websites by various brands. We also have marketplaces, you know, like Amazon, Noon. Uh, we have you know all, all sorts of uh, distributors which are distributing dif different products online to customers. Here, the importance of IP comes into picture first from your products perspective is that you need to build customer confidence. Here, if you do not protect your IP and you're not uh, you know, consciously uh, protecting as well as uh, taking action toward any uh, you know, counterfeit product or any, any, you know, uh, any lower quality products, the consumers will lose their uh, you know, confidence in your products because consumers are virtually buying everything. Mm -hmm. And you need to build that confidence. So, you know, these issues is, uh, you know, with the e-commerce and with the, uh, you know, uh, shopping happening majorly online, you know, this has become even a bigger need to go for protections. Uh, yeah. Quickly, I will just give you uh, two other things. The other yeah. thing that we face is, Suppose I have to distribute my products. I face this issue uh, in distribution agreements. When we go to a distributor, the first question he asks me is uh, whether your product, so I, I go to a distributor, okay, I go to Saudi, I say, you please distribute my products. He says, do you have, first question, do you have registration in Saudi? If I don't, mm -hmm. I do not become eligible for my product to you know, get distributed in Saudi. Mm -hmm. So it That's has a become a commercial need. You know, it mm -hmm. is such a big commercial need that wherever I want to expand or wherever I want to pull out uh, somebody to sell my product or service, I first need to protect my IP because that is going to be asked from me. The other aspect is if you're going into licensing, franchising, again, uh, you know, the first question they ask you is, is your IP, your you know, what you're licensing to us, are you fully, you know, uh, an owner about you know of it. Are you having all the rights in all the territories? So all of this, you know, you see if you if you uh, have problems in the IP, if you don't fully protect them, there are issues which come in all of these aspects. Mm -hmm. No, that's super insightful, Bayan. In fact, I didn't know this, that if you have to distribute your goods in other countries, and especially if you're a reputed, uh, you know, company, then you need to have like your IP registered in that country. So I never knew that. That's a good, interesting insight there. Um, and yeah, so um, Munif, I'm sure you have a lot of examples, you know, your sub IP has been around for so many years, and I'm sure you have like, uh, you know, thousands of examples to share. We do, we do. But um, uh, first off, to continue on Payal's um, uh, conversation and, and uh, argument, uh, because I, I fully support this. In, uh, people need to understand that in certain cases and certain countries, it is a matter of compliance. You cannot operate in a particular country until you, you have uh, properly protected and registered your IP rights, uh, whether trademarks, whether patents, whether designs, whatever, any sort of, of IP right. Um, and the more visible you are, and by visible I mean successful and exposed, the more prone you are in terms of infringement, uh, third-party infringement. So you are you, you become a target. I think about people who would like to uh, copy your products or copy your services or copy your model, business model. Um, if you're successful, then then. You would be you'd be a, an easier target for them because it's 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 there. People are familiar with your product, your, with your trademark, for example, with your brand. So it's 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 a shortcut for these people. So um, and during this time, especially during this time with with, with COVID and, and and how things have changed and how even our our lifestyle, our shopping habits, our day to day uh, activities, everything has changed. So e-commerce, fintech, all these light assets. Um, uh, industries and especially startups, they can easily just pick up and scale. Uh, they can they can cross uh, countries overnight. It's 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 uh, it's not um, as complicated as the the other uh, sectors. So these guys from these sectors, they need to be fully aware of the consequences. All they need to do is just ask the right people, ask the right questions. How do we go to this country? How do we penetrate that particular market? Uh, and the answers are usually free. Certainly not Google. Google would not give them the right answers. They just need to speak to a lawyer or, not, or an IP firm or, or someone who is aware of, of, um, uh, of the legal framework 
uh, when it comes to IP, and then they'll get the right answers. So going back to your question with regards to the uh, examples, and, and, and so I'll just give you one, one example that happened recently. We were, in, we were involved in an uh, M&A transaction, um, and the, the company we represented, they were, but we, we came in uh, later in the game. The, the M&A uh, document was signed. Uh, the whole transaction was done. And the, the uh, IP section, when it comes to the due diligence, was not drafted properly. So when we were invited uh, to represent this company and execute the transaction when it, with, with regards to the patents and, and trademarks, little did they know that the patents are of no value because the 20-year 20, 20 uh, protection term was, was over. So these, these patents are, are now part of the public domain. They have absolutely no value. So this whole uh, transaction, which which was mainly done because of the patent of the of the uh, company they acquired, had had no value. So had they done the, the due diligence, or the people who who uh, were part of it, they from the legal stand from the legal uh, team were, were were involved in the IP part, it shouldn't have happened. Hmm. Okay, that's a really interesting example. So. I guess, yeah, I guess in due diligences, uh, in diligences as well, in M&A transactions, IP, it's such a big, big thing. Uh, in, even investors, when they're, you know, doing yeah. due diligence on startups, they actually look into the IP. That's one of the key things that they look at. So, yeah, interesting example, Maneev. Uh, and how about Vivek? Vivek, do you have any examples to share? Maybe an example of what happens when you actually protect IP, you know, how, how, how does it help you? Okay, yeah. So what uh, I will say, so I will uh, start from the point I left. So uh, in the earlier conversation, we discussed what, what uh, like how IP has a correlation or, or uh, conjunction with the normal property. And we also understood like IP could be of different types, fashion, trademark, okay. Right. And if you have different aspects of your invention or, or your creativity, you have to file that a sort of build, uh, application into that category. And coming to your example, wherein, uh, wherein what benefits one has got or one company has got when they have protected their IP rights. So what I will say that they are, so one of our clients, mm -hmm. so they were, uh, in, they are into uh, uh, robotic automation and they are uh, using AI to, to uh, implement in the, uh, in the uh, robotic process overall. And they have been uh, in this in this overall product development and R&D for, for uh, many years. But they were, what, what the deficiency or gap was there, they were not able to identify what they are creating. And if you are not, or one company is not able to create or not able to evaluate what they are creating, then they will not be able to protect it and they will not be able to file it. So the steps are, first, you have to have awareness about the IP rights, and when you have the awareness, then you'll be able to identify the IP rights, and then you'll be able to protect it. And if you have protected, then when if there is any infringement, you'll be able to take appropriate actions. So that company was involved in the R&D. They might be having the awareness, but there was no process, internal process, wherein they could have identified what sort of IP rights they are generating. So we got associated with them. So first uh, activity which uh, we did with them, we set up the internal process to identify and evaluate what IPs you are generating. And when we set up that process, we were able to file the patent applications for more than 100 patent applications in one single year, last year, and I think this year we'll be filing more than 200 patent applications for them globally. And now because of that process, because of uh, the filing of the patent applications, now that company, the valuation of that company is close to 4.5 billion. And what was uh, before, before uh, they have filed these patent applications. So because of identification and because of filing of the patent applications at a, at a, at a uh, bigger level or at a global level, their valuation got increased fold in just two years of time. I will say in just 18 months of time. So that is the benefit mm -hmm. which companies get when they identify their IP rights and take required steps to file and protect the IP rights. 
Mm -hmm. No, that's an interesting example. Definitely a lot of startups, what they do is they, you know, they start taking IP seriously when they've got to raise funds because your valuation definitely increases when you have a strong uh, IP, you know, framework in your business. Uh, you know, so on that yeah. note, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, on that note, I think it would be just useful for us to get a very basic idea of the legal framework surrounding IP. And maybe, Muni, if you could start with what's the you know IP framework in the Middle East and how it compares to the global you know the global framework. Sure. So, IP is is uh, is a little bit special in that respect, and this is because um, IP is is generally. It falls under under international uh, treaties. So you've got WIPO, which is the the World Intellectual Property Organization. This is this is part of uh, the UN, and um, any member state who become part of this, they have to adapt to the uh, the laws and regulations of the uh, enforced by those uh, treaties. Um, and and today in 2021, most of these countries are. So the differences are actually on the operational side, on the processes side, which is minimal. So um, whether you would, you would have to have a, a simply signed POA, for example, or you need to have it uh, uh, legalized up to the uh, respective consulate. Uh, so these, these, these um, um, types of differences, uh, which are operational, but let's remember something, Middle East, there's, there's, Middle East is a political term. Uh, it refers to a, to a certain region. By the end of the day, the, 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 this region is fragmented. These are independent countries. Each country has its own set of laws and regu regulations and practices. So what, what is acceptable in Saudi, for example, is not necessarily acceptable in Egypt or in UAE, for that matter. Um, the differences are minimal. Uh, and, and as I said, they're pretty much um, universal, the practices and the, the, the approach. Uh, one country stands out, which is Iraq. Iraq, they adopt um, uh, a unique uh, uh, classification system when it comes to, to, the, um, uh, to trademarks. And even the examination uh, process is a little bit different. But aside from Iraq, I think they're, they're all, uh, they're all uh, the same. Um, the protection term with trademarks. So, so most countries have a 10-year protection term. Others, and this is, I'm, I'm talking about the, the, the global level, not only in the, in the, the GCC or in the MENA region. Um, so you have some of them have seven a seven year, seven year term uh, protection for for trademarks. Others others have more, but in general they're, they're, they're all uh, ten years. Um, so these are the the major um, differences, ma mainly mainly uh, process process related differences. I understand, I understand. No, no, that makes sense. I think the legalization process is one big difference between, you know, the, the, the global framework. Uh, but uh, Payal, maybe you want to shed some light here in terms of the practical differences as well, because I know you've practiced both in India and, uh, you know, the UAE. So what, what, is, what has been in your experience, the key differences in terms of the legal framework? Yeah, Priyasha. So uh, if I compare it to the Indian uh, Trademarks Act, there are a few uh, major differences. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll start with trademarks. Uh, in Trademarks uh, Act of India, any individual can also file for a brand. Whereas in UAE, uh, mostly companies and organizations have been given that right. Mm -hmm. uh, second uh, thing is uh, when you, is uh, about when does your trademark uh, registration or certificate become invalid. In UAE, if you get into liquidation, if your company goes into liquidation, automatically your TM certificate will be canceled. So this is one thing uh, the companies need to keep in mind if they are liquidating. Now, you know, you may not be liquidating because of, uh, you know, your closure of business. You may be, you may be a group of companies, you may be shutting down few companies and, you know, transferring your business to other companies. So this is, mm -hmm. and you need to be uh, very conscious that in which company does your IP lie, especially in mm -hmm. MNCs and group companies. Yeah. This is, I, I'll talk about it later when we talk about IP strategy uh, is that, you know, which company is owning uh, the IP and or maybe few companies in various territories would have some IP in their name. 
or uh, enough they're part of a group. So while you are liquidating a company, uh, you need to transfer or assign your IP. Otherwise, it may get in the UAE, it may get cancelled automatically. But shouldn't the case be the same in India? Because if you're closing down the company, then and if the company owns the IP, the IP uh, gets, uh, you know, in India, cancelled, it is right? no. Uh, in India, there is no automatic cancellation. You will still have the right. Your trademark applications will still proceed. It is up to you whether you want to withdraw that application or you want to assign it. It is. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is not so date specific. And there is no provision which says that, you know, it will be an automatic termination of the registration certificate. I see. I so see. one needs to be conscious in the UA for these two matters. Okay, no, no sounds really interesting. That's a very good practical insight. Um, Helen, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about, let's say, your experience in the UK and uh, let's say even in China in terms of, you know, what are the differences you've seen in the IP regime? Yeah, so thanks so much for asking. So back in 2000, actually, I a um, marketing course in one of the largest universities in Shanghai and it was uh, sponsored by uh, actually it was like a London mayor initiative and what was interesting one of the first things they wanted to do in introducing China to us was actually on intellectual property so that obviously shows you you know for um, you know professionals if you think okay what's the first taste and maybe for some people it's coming if you've come to Dubai it's come and look at Burj Khalifa or something like this So they were very quick in wanting us all to sort of understand what's the scene in terms of intellectual property. There is one film I would love to recommend you all to watch. It's a romantic comedy, but actually it's a twist to sort of illustrate um, the situation in China. It's called Shanghai Calling, and I think I could best illustrate this story to you all. So the idea is, um, so as you may all know, you know, the last, you know, I say 10, 15 years, 20 years, you know, China opened tremendously. So, you know, as you probably would have felt it physically, you know, the influx of Chinese tourists and all this, this is pre-COVID, of course. There's a film called Shanghai Calling. So make a note called Shanghai Calling. It's probably a good, you know, I don't know, eight years old now. But this film makes me laugh because it's about a second generation, uh, supposedly Chinese American lawyer who obviously has never set foot in China, has no idea about Chinese culture, only speaks English, is a a Westerner by all standards and goes back to China, his motherland to try and do business. But lo and behold, nothing makes sense to him. So for instance, um, conversations to be had um, that are supposed to be in private settings are out in a place where you're going to eat dumplings, okay? So there's an issue of privacy. Uh, He's been told, you know, there's been a breach of IP issue. He has to go and tackle it. So he uses his own standard, let's say, as a New Yorker to go and deal with this IP issue. Obviously, um, there's a language barrier for a start. And then secondly, he doesn't even know who to talk to because nobody's giving him straight answers. So in the end, people go, well, you need to talk to this guy called Mr. Wang. And he's like, this who, Mr. Who? And so it's the whole concept. It's not who you know, what you know, but, you know, it's really connecting the dots. So in essence, Mr. Wang is a private detector. And Mr. Wang knows all the inside news of every organization because he's sort of like the, the go-to man. So any lo and behold, the twist of the story is when you watch this film, you think the bad guys are all Chinese doing the, you know, the, um, the intellectual property dub on these supposedly invisible mobile phones and the CEO being a Texan and an innocent American, but the plot reverses. So actually what happens, it's the American who's actually been dubbing the phone. So I want invite you all to watch this film because it's hilarious, it's funny, but I think it, it, it summarizes really well how we as lawyers, we get surprised all the time. So uh, that's just a, a, a takeaway for you all. Yeah. No, no, thanks so much, Helen. No, I definitely, I'm going to put that on my watch list, uh, watching list, you know, Shanghai calling. Um, you know, I haven't really watched a movie in a really long time, so maybe I should start with that. <laughs> okay, so I think let's move our discussion into, you know, the, the meat of it, which is, you know, talking about IP strategy. And I think one of the questions that I have in my head is, you know, what are the industries and sectors where one should ideally have an IP strategy? Is it that, you know, there are certain industries where it's super important or is it that some industri- some sectors are not that, uh, you know, that doesn't really require it that much? So maybe, uh, you know, if, if you could shed light there, uh, Vivek, in terms of what are the industries and sectors you've seen, uh, 
which are let's say more important than the others okay so what i will explain or answer this question is uh, it is important for for all the sector primarily however different type of ip are, are like uh, the types are patent trademark design copyright primarily so for one industry segment or for one uh, particular domain maybe the patents are more relevant for other uh, type of business maybe the trademarks are more relevant maybe for some designs are more relevant for other industry sector maybe copyrights are important so either one type of ip or the two or three or four these are important for all the i i i cannot assume any industry sector or any domain for which mm-hmm. ip rights are not important for some let's say uh, for pharma for pharma the patents are very very critical trademarks are also equally important but for pharma industry designs uh, are not that much relevant except for the medical devices and uh, then then copyrights are also not that much important let's say now coming to the software industry for software patents are important and again maybe uh, for for software related industry patents are are uh, relevant in one country maybe not the other because some of the countries are not uh, very very inclined towards granting the patents for software related invention but on the other side some of the countries do allow so for software related uh, business patents are one thing copyrights are very very important because for codes your object code your source code all the countries allow for copyright registration then then trademarks are uh, again relevant for that industry also designs are not design industrial design so in other way one industry uh, or or then one has to evaluate like which industry sector you belong to then then you have to evaluate your ip right and then you have to identify like i should file for or i should opt for which type of ip right so this is this is the example which i uh, want to share maybe if you have or or you want any extension to this answer so let me know no no it sounds good i uh, know i think that's that's an interesting perspective to think about it really depends on you know the business of the company and there's a different ip that could be applicable depending on you know the business of the company uh, munif do you have any insights there i mean any based on the middle your experience in the middle east sure sure so um let, let's take a step back a little bit so usually let's talk about the growth strategy all all business um, uh, entities they do have a growth strategy whether documented or not whether whether properly implemented or not they they the least they have is a vision in 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 a five year time i would like to be in this region i would like to to expand into that region i would like to expand into this service offering these these uh, types of goods it depends but mainly the, there has to be a direction whether documented or not once you have this direction this once this direction is identified this would um, um uh, i this would be aligned with your ip strategy so they go hand in hand once this the first one is is uh, set the ip strategy goes in line with it and by ip strategy what exactly am i i referring to i'm referring to number one identifying the core markets what core markets are there if you, if if you if we're talking about geographical expansion is are you are you happy with staying in the uae uh, for the uh, next five years for example mm-hmm. do you want to expand towards asia do you want to expand towards the remaining gcc countries for example these are answers that these are questions that would be answered by answered by the uh, business owners in terms of um, service offering in terms of product offering um are you are you con- content with what you have now or you have other plans into expanding towards different other um, uh, sectors um with these things identified then we are we are 50% there once we're done with this part then we would identify the type of ip rights that is worthy of being protected and worthy of being capitalized on so as vivek um, uh, mentioned we we need to identify the co- whether there's a copyright that is worthy of being registered protected and and uh, capitalized on the same goes for for the trademark and how many trademarks are we talking about lots of people mm-hmm. think that well the trademark is just the name of the company well no it's not not uh, the name of the company or your identity is one 
but there's lots of companies companies have have a lot of um, uh, other trademarks that are uh, being recognized to the consumer and then they have a value so um this is another aspect of it patents of yeah. course patents patents in in specific is an expensive exercise so you have to be very careful of how do you deal with with patents and if you don't have the the adequate um, uh, protection then your whole investment is is gone for nothing um yeah. so yeah this is my my yeah. uh, two cents on on, uh, on yeah this. Yeah, I guess the challenge for a lot of startups and SMEs, especially who want to take their business to the next level is that, okay, you know, costs is an issue. Yeah, because everybody knows that, okay, protecting IP is important, but uh, costs can be a barrier. So I no, guess it's, maybe... It's, it's, not an, it's not a luxury. Some, uh, yeah. Mistakenly, some, some startup founders, they think, well, you know what, I don't have time for this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, let's talk bootstrapping now. Let's talk about launching the business. Let's scale. Let's do this and let's do that. And they forget that, well, I, I know startups is all about cutting corners. It's all about growth. It's all about scaling fast. It's all about um, um, breaking barriers and all that. And I salute them uh, for that. But in the meantime, they're dropping the ball on, on a lot of other aspects that are worthy of so much. If, mm-hmm. Why scale if you cannot capitalize on what you have? Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a luxury. It's not like... True, what Payal mentioned about the, the legalization and, and having these um, 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 IP mm-hmm. rights registered properly through the right channels in order for you to, to be able to penetrate and operate in a certain country, it's, it's, that's very true. But mm-hmm. aside from that, even the, forget the legal aspect of it, let's talk about the commercial aspect of it and the return on investment. If, if you're not properly, um, if you do not properly plan your next step, then you're just wasting money. You're just wasting money over over something that is uh, unnecessary if you planned it well. Mm-hmm. Way ahead. Yeah, yeah. It In fact, uh, you just need to have a plan. That's all. True, true, true. No, that, those are really imp- uh, great points, Manif. Uh, maybe uh, we'll cover a quick question before we we take some questions from uh, you know the attendees. But I'm going to quickly ask Pyle, what are your tips for uh, you know like maintain like an IP strategy? Because you've worked for corporate, so you would have like some insights in terms of you know what are the key things a company must do uh, in terms of having an IP strategy. Yes, sure, uh, Priyasha. So uh, I would just like to talk about your previous question. You know, I found that uh, it's a very interesting question that which company can actually skip IP, you know? So uh, when everybody's looking at, you know, we don't, everybody, you know, biggest of organizations, they are not happy to spend on IP. So I was just thinking, so the thing is, the only, only, only place I see is genetics. Genetics would uh, have something like, you know, they, they are not really branded. Uh, they uh, follow technology or whatever, you know, their ingredients are already, you know, uh, copied from uh, another successful product in the market. So I think um, uh, genetics uh, would be something which, and they are uh, manufactured in mass. You know, so uh, something those are like you're being protected, uh, Payal. As a, as yeah, a yeah. So I think <laughs> those, those are <laughs> that is genetics are the yeah. last in the queue. But yeah. I think still IP is important for them. Exactly. Yeah. If we're talking patents, yes. But if we're talking yeah. trademarks, yeah. Even those are worthy. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Genetics Come don't need patents. Way. They work on no, patents. No, no, they don't. This is what I'm saying. Yeah. But their trademark no. can be protected. Genetics, you know, uh, when when the patent uh, protection goes, you know, you have a patent for 20 years. After that, 20 years is that the patent becomes public. I'm Anybody can you. make I'm anything. Agreeing. I'm agreeing with you. And, you know, about that and then that is when the genetics jump into the picture. You know, you have so many, not just pharma, but a lot of other products. Yeah. Uh, so even they, I think, would need IP in terms of branding. Maybe. Got it, got it. But uh, but what yeah. what would your like like I said, coming back to the question, what could your what would your tips be in terms of you know? Having yes, I'll come back to my question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, Priyasha, so the thing is, uh, IP strategy. Now this has become crucially important, uh, not just for large organizations, but even for startups. You know, as as uh, Munif uh, pointed out. 
So uh, I'll just uh, quickly go, I don't, I will um, categorize a few things. So one is, um, how do you make a strategy for a company? One is that you need to see the product line, your territory, your geography, uh, whatever your, uh, you know, uh, your, if you are into inventions or if you're just into trading, all of this is decisive. And what are your business predictions and what are your business goals? Uh, first important point to see here is uh, to see uh, what is your IP structure flow? What is which company, uh, you know, if it is a group or if it is a company uh, which has a multinational, uh, you know, uh, uh, reach, which company of yours will own the IP? You might have IP which is there in the UAE, in the, uh, in, in the US, in India, in Southeast Asia. So uh, which of all of this IP, would you want one company to own all of this or you want separate companies to own this? This is one first decision that you need to take as you know, uh, being part of the board that where should your IP lie? Yeah. Uh, in fact, a lot is, of companies, like a lot of companies have SPVs, right? Special purpose vehicles to house the IP. Because like you mentioned, if an operational company were to close down, then, you know, your IP goes with it. So I guess people have special purpose vehicles for IPs, isn't it? Yeah, true. That's, that's one of the things, you know, and the other, uh, this decision depends on the usage. Uh, where, where are you using your IP, you know, which is your main market and the other, uh, thing is taxation issues. So uh, you, you're talking about SPVs that is mostly taxation based. You know, uh, you would find SPVs in tax uh, havens where you do not have tax to pay. And that is how you're collecting all your IP and, you know, value mm -hmm. of your business in a tax haven. So uh, those are a bit complex matters, but this is, uh, I think, a primary thing to decide where should your IP lie? Would it lie in multiple companies or would it lie in a one, one, one uh, group company of yours? Uh, mm -hmm. the, third, uh, the second aspect I want to talk about is um, what should your IP be, uh, strategy be based on? Uh, for you know, my own personal ease, I uh, base it on three things, promotion, protection, and profiting. So because you are part of a business, you have to see how you should promote IP uh, in the business. How should uh, your employees, uh, your, uh, you know, your customers, how should they know that you uh, are uh, very, uh, you know, uh, very conscious about your IP? And it should start with the promotion, you know, of your IP in the organization itself. This is uh, when, uh, you know, uh, various uh, large organizations, I, you know, uh, I would give examples of various uh, big uh, technology organizations like TCS, Tata Consultancy Service, like Samsung, like Apple, Google, all of these companies, you would see that they have very strong IP strategies. And uh, they are, uh, they start with the fundamental that they create awareness in their organization about promoting uh, about innovations and protections. So, uh, you know, uh, so after promotion, yeah, no, that, uh, after that's really important. Yeah, I mean, like I think all the larger organizations are definitely they give a lot of uh, you know focus on IP and examples like you mentioned. Um, everybody knows that you know they, they have a very very uh, you know like let's say strong policy when it comes to trade is trade secrets and all of that because we're like it's. If you're an important, if you're a big organization, then um, you know you. It's so important to uh, to have all your secrets, you know, protected really well. And I think they do that. They start with their employees. Yeah, true. So you know, I'll give you uh, 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 an example. Um, TCS has a mm -hmm. patent. So what we are discussing right now are what is the IP strategy? What are the best methods uh, to maintain mm -hmm. a sustainable IP portfolio? TCS Data Consultancy Service has a US patent on uh, how to have an IP portfolio. So I would recommend, you know, uh, it was uh, granted in uh, April to 2017. I would mm -hmm. recommend, you know, if anybody interested, you should go through uh, how they are actually uh, building their IP portfolio and uh, they have even patented it. 
you know okay. so uh, that is how uh, the level of consciousness and you know uh, uh, you get a lot of ideas from these people no uh, i think i think that's a really good point while maybe you know in the interest of time i was just thinking that if you could just address a question we have a question you know in in our chat and i'm going to quickly read it out uh, how does ip apply in the training industry into a business education school sector when it is across countries and this is from darlene and they are based in south africa uh, so uh, i don't know vivek you want to take this question yes so i think for for darlene um, i i was about to answer her question i was typing in the chat box but good you have okay. uh, asked that question so i think for for this type of uh, this sort of business and uh, sector what they can do first of all if they are running the online courses or if they have built or they are in the process of developing any platform which is having some technology behind it some some uh, some features behind it so first of all they can also think about filing patents around it to protect that aspect the the uh, technical uh, front uh, via patents then uh, the second important point would be to file the trademark application in south africa and maybe other uh, countries of interest and to file the trademark applications in a in an economical and cost effective way maybe uh, she can choose to file a uh, madrid application via madrid application in multiple countries and the third would be to protect the the uh, the codes so they might have developed a lot of algorithms codes uh, object code or source code so she can also try to protect these codes via filing copyright application and copyright protection is very very simple and if uh, she will be able to protect these in uh, one country so via berne convention rule she will be able to get the registration or or protection in all the countries which are part of the berne convention so this is what i think uh, she can she can go for i hope that answers the question darlene I mean, you can always unmute yourself if, if you know, yeah. you'd like to get any clarifications. Thank you so much. Thank you for affording me the time. It's really great to see the panel. Thank you. And thank you very much, Vivek, Vivek sorry, for the, the answer. I think that does give me some sort of um, direction. Um, in the meantime, if I was to start doing business uh, in UAE, for example, mm -hmm without my patents and the TM applications. There's a TM on certain things, but not on others, on some of the, um, the footage that we've recorded and the training that we've done for education, for example, where we work with yeah. differentiated learning techniques for students to increase yeah. their learning skills. Um, and then in business, we work with team development um, and team building to increase productivity within teams. So if we were to start utilizing that beforehand, would that be unwise? Do I have to wait and go through six months, a year, et cetera, process? Because I am not too sure of all the processes within South Africa. Um, and currently things are pretty, um, a little bit slower over here because we have a number of challenges besides COVID we also have um, a number of other areas where we've got electricity issues, et cetera. So um, things are taking long. So what would you recommend in the meantime if I did want to do training? Uh, I think, darling, let's go a step behind. So let me give you another perspective. So you are in the process of developing something very unique. So one way could be to protect these and, and file uh, different types of IP applications in South Africa and in other countries. That's, that's one aspect. Let's look at the other aspect. What I will recommend for, for such initiatives wherein you think that you are doing something very unique and very different, which has not been explored by anyone else before you. For such activities, I always recommend inventors and business owners and entrepreneurs like you to go for the state of the art search. What is the state of the art search? Wherein you will disclose your invention to, to any attorney like me or to Muni or to anyone else. 
and they will conduct a very, a very very thorough search in the patent databases and they will identify certain patents which are and in doing so you and they will prepare a report also we call it patentability search report or you can say the landscape search or landscape search or the uh, so they will uh, be identifying certain patents which have been filed may be granted by by others before you and when you will look at these documents you will be able to understand what has already been explored before you and there are chances maybe you will be able to fine tune your process your invention your way forward on one hand and maybe on the other hand if these patents are not valid let's say in south africa maybe in us which are your which might be your country's of interest then you can explore or you can utilize these patents in a very very legitimate way to develop your offering to develop your product in these ways so that could be another aspect so i hope like i have covered or answered your question dr thank you very much um could you please tell me where do we go from here if we want to discuss it privately or um in a different forum because i understand that we are um limited with time over here yeah so what i will do darling i will share my email id in the chat box and we can connect after after uh, webinar yeah in fact I, all of the panelists you know you can share your details on the chat box so if any of uh, you know the attendees if you want to get in touch with the panelists so feel free to get in touch with them after the session thank you i'd like to add add here something so darling i what i uh, if i'm correct you want to come to uae right we would like to we would like to look at an opportunity of moving forward with consolidon and moving into the ua to establish even if it is um at the moment an office just uh via um the internet at the moment that we okay okay so uh, can you answer me uh do you have copyrights on your uh, brand name or on your logos or on your compilations we have on on our basic assessment instrument we have a trademark which has actually been afforded to us by um the USA so that's been great but um in terms of the the development and the ongoing development that we are doing with students because we obviously had to um pivot in a different way with um covid for students and for team building so on those developments i don't have copyright right now okay so i i you know it's it's just a, a, a alternative that you can do uh, copyright uh, is a more faster it's a smarter choice when you're stuck in situations like these trademarks is costlier obviously it takes time as you're aware copyright uh, even if you apply in south africa it will cover about 187 countries and you can then you know uh, uh, for the preliminary you know your starting of business you can base and you can have some sort of protection in the form of copyrights so um, you will not uh, you we just need to check uh, yeah uae is the part of the burn convention uh, which covers uh, copyrights so um uh, you can just check up with your local lawyers uh, how much time will it take to have copyrights uh, registered in case you're not able to register you can still use the word c over all your materials on your websites start using the word c symbol it will still give you um uh, you know uh, 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 protection but for um, better uh, protection you can register your copyrights you can register your logos you can register your compilations whatever uh, material you're circulating to your uh, students or you know uh, whatever you want uh, any literary publication you can get copyright and you can start using the symbol c thank you thank you so much uh, darlene if i if you if you allow me please to jump in so just to give you a little, a little bit of comfort here so copyrights you you don't need the registration to prove your rights uh it's a tool to enforce your rights copyright is is, is uh, by definition is protected from the time you create the work of art right so um unlike trademarks and unlike patents your right does not start from the time 
you get registered or you get uh, granted. It's it, from the time you create the, the work of art. Now, the uh, copyright registration is something, is, it's a tool to prove that you are the owner of this right uh, on this date, on, on this, uh, at this time. And it's a cross-border thing. So um, uh, as, as mentioned by my, the, uh, my fellow panelists, it's a cross-border thing because there's something called the Bern Convention, Bern, uh, the, the Swiss city. Um, uh, and approximately, as, as, as mentioned also, more than 175 uh, countries are part of this uh, convention. So the minute you are registered in one country, you get protection across all these uh, member states. Uh, trademarks and patents, these are uh, territorial uh, 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 IP rights. And then by territorial, we mean if you're not registered in, in the UAE, for example, you, you do not own that trademark in UAE. Someone else might file uh, the same trademark and, and, and get it. Uh, same, same, as, same for patents. So uh, with few differences, of course. So, um, but yeah, this is something that is worth exploring. Definitely get, get in touch with, with an IP firm or, or, or with a law firm uh, to get more details on this part and how can you better uh, protect yourself and, and uh, have your business uh, grow. Thank you. This has been extremely helpful. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Anyways, uh, yeah. Thanks so much to all of uh, you know all of the panelists. I mean, I just realized that one hour actually can fly by so much. <laughs> uh, you know, we could just go on and on. Uh, you know, top, uh, talking about this topic, but. Uh, uh, thank you very much to all the panelists uh, for your time. It was a pleasure to have you all. Uh, uh, and also to all of you who've attended, uh, thank you very much for joining. I hope you found this session very insightful and useful. If you want to continue the conversation, please feel free to get in touch with, uh, with you know, the panelists. Uh, you know, you, you know all of the names. It's very easy to now connect with people on LinkedIn or even via email. So we'd love to uh, continue having, uh, you know, this conversation. And just to let you know, there are a lot many events uh, in the Connected Insights of Web Summit. So if you want to attend any during the course of this week or and the, the next couple of days in, in, in the next week, please feel free to check out our schedule in the website. Um, and yeah, look forward to engaging with all of you again. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Monif, Vivek, Payal, and Helen for your time. Uh, very uh, appreciated. Thank you very thank much. You so much. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you, Trisha. Yeah, thank you everyone for attending. So this concludes the webinar. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.